welcome. Wonderful to see you. I do hope that a few other people will join us uh, as we start. And welcome back to this Omer series where we have decided to start with Leah Goldberg and we will see how we go and how much time we spend with her poetry. And then the next project is Ulrich Greenberg, which is a totally, totally different proposition. So I hope that you that we will have time to have a taste of both. And just in case, since many of you, all of you actually here right now, are people who have participated in the previous series, anything that comes to mind that you want to say before we start from your experience of studying poetry together, something you want me to pay attention to, this would be a good moment to tell me as we get started. And if I see none of your hands raised, then I will put my PowerPoint on and we will start. So here we go, Lea Goldberg, and I called this first chapter, if you wish, of the poems of Lea Goldberg that we will be looking at, Roads. It's a name I chose because a, I put in it a poems in which we can hear the poetic voice of walking or riding places or thinking about road, uh, roads, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. At the end, uh, you will see a note that says a room for rent. This is not a poem. This is a children's book by Lea Goldberg. And we will definitely, definitely take time to study it. Very probably not today. So just a word as you can see the picture of Lea Goldberg and a few words of introduction. You know how oftentimes uh, names mean a lot to us. And when you start studying Israeli Hebrew literature with me, we oftentimes start with Rachel. And so we had Rachel in, in our class earlier, and now we have a Lea. And the question is, is there a connection beyond our automatic need to put Rachel and Leah together or Rachel and Leah juxtaposed to each other? So I'll say, as a matter of fact, there are points that are worth looking at of resemblance between the two. And yet there are very, very big differences as well. So let me start with the resemblance. Like Rachel, like many other poets of the period, although I would say not a whole generation apart, but, but almost, Lea Goldberg comes from Eastern Europe, born in the very Eastern tip of Germany in Königsberg, but a, most of her life until she makes Aliyah in 1935 is in Kovna, Lithuania. Tragic family history. Uh, if you look at the year when she was born, which is 1911, and then she passes in 1970. So really young, not even 60, <coughs> which again is a point of resemblance to Rachel, who died at 40 some. And the year 70, every single time I mention it, 1970 was one of the most tragic, painful year as Israeli Hebrew poetry goes and literature in general. In 1970, Lea Goldberg died, Nathan Alterman died, Shmuel Yastaf Agnon died, uh, Avigdor Meiri died in 1970. And I, I remember it, I was an adult, I was living here, I was a very young mother, first pregnant and mother. My first child was born in October of 1970. As like one after the other, all these great poets of my growing up years and of the literary world I was a, raised on. And among those, personally speaking, the loss of Leah Goldberg was the greatest. And why is that? And this again will take us into the comparison. I don't think that ever when I introduce Israeli Hebrew poets to you, did I mention academic education or PhDs? 
you know, you come to the Bialiks of this world, it's of course yeshiva education. And you come to a person like Rachel, yes, she had a high school education and some personal tutoring at home. And she was planning to go study in a university, art and music, but then instead of that made Aliyah and becomes a pioneer. And I could go on and on. They all were highly well-read people, but Leah Goldberg in, a, in the twenties leaves Lithuania to go to Germany and have a PhD in the language of the Shomronim, the Hebrew version that the Shomronim spoke from first she studies in Berlin and then she finishes her PhD in Bonn. So then she goes back and still works uh, for the university in Kovno. While all that time since high school, she is a fluent first student and then a fluent speaker and writer in Hebrew. Leah Goldberg had published Hebrew poetry before she ever made Aliyah. I mean, th this is like really different. It's a particular story and high academic education from a Western European university in those years between the two world wars. A, when she comes to Israel in 1935, she is welcomed immediately to the circle of the leading poets of the time, who would be Avram Shlonsky, Nathan Alterman, and Orland, and a few others. So, so she really has a home, and they actually welcome her with making sure that her first published book in Eretz Israel would be handed to her upon her aliyah. So Tabaot Ashan, Rings of Smoke, a, appears as a welcome gift by Shlonsky and Alterman to Leah Goldberg, the newly arrived poet from Lithuania, the center of Jewish education at the time. A, she lives in Israel, first in Tel Aviv, then she will move to Yerushalayim and extremely productive in her work. Not only her beautiful lyrical poetry, but also a quite a number of children's book of which we will study the most famous, A Room for Rent, or rather more precisely, An Apartment for Rent. She, she writes articles for newspapers. She translates Russian and other poetry and literature into Hebrew. Many of us who studied in high school, pieces by Tolstoy or pieces by Ibsen as such, they were translated via the German or via the Russian into Hebrew by Leah Goldberg. A, and then the thing for which I missed her most when she passed is that she established the chair of comparative literature in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and had it as long as she lived. And this was my greatest hope to go to Jerusalem and study comparative literature in the faculty that Leah Goldberg had created and taught in. She died too soon for me to be able to do that. And I studied literature elsewhere, but I experienced her passing really as a personal loss. I was hoping to be able to sit in a classroom where she taught and there were legends taught about those classes. Let us add that her early death of cancer was very probably connected to the fact that she was a heavy smoker. And it's not a, an accident a, or a coincidence that her first book was called Rings of Smoke because she, she used to sit in cafes or other places, smoke and write. Uh, lots of stories about her, uh, of people who knew her personally. And for those of you who speak Hebrew, uh, a beautiful documentary made by the group called Ha'ivrim, the Hebrews, not Ivrim as in blind, but Ivrim as in Hebrew, as Avraham Ivri. That's, there's a huge uh, internet site and they are collecting a 
interviews with people who know these great poets and out of these interviews, they create a documentary. And there's a beautiful, beautiful one about Leah Goldberg. So those of you who speak Ivrit, let me know. I can send you the link. Or you can just go, Ha Ivrim, hey, I am Bet Reshmem eh, on the internet, and you will find it. And then go for Leah Goldberg, and you will find the movie. <coughs> you can probably find it on YouTube as well. I think this will serve as an introduction with one additional note. And that is that Leah Goldberg is known for, I would say, consciously not joining the trend, the branch of poets of her time, before her and after her, to relate to national themes. She is not writing about building kibbutzim, and she is not writing about wars, and she is not writing about the Holocaust. She is writing personal poetry. So much so that Avraham Shlonsky, the greatest poet at the time, who heads the group Yachdav, reprimands her in a newspaper article when he says, in these days, as World War II erupts, as the news about World War II reached the Yishuv in Eretz Israel, all of us should lend our pens to the cause. All of us should be writing about national and Jewish issues. And therefore, when we start, we will start with Leah Goldberg's response to that. So she's not really writing a poem about the Shoah in 1943, but she's writing a Leah Goldberg poem in which she allows the feelings that the loss is happening over there at the other end, at the other home where she comes from that is being destroyed while she is living here. So that would be our introduction. We are not going chronologically. We will then retreat to the earlier poems. With Leah Goldberg, it's always personal. And in an odd way, and we have said that many a time, the more personal and individual a poem gets, is written, the more universal it ends up being. Okay, so uh, just let me check if there are questions so far or comments. And if there is none, and welcome those who are overcoming the difficulties of technology today and joining us as we could. So you shall walk in the fields or at Telchi Basade. Uh, I know that this is only Hebrew, but I wanted this just for us to see the picture again, the years of the life and of, of Leah Goldberg, 1911 to 1970. And you can see that her poetry oftentimes gets all sorts of productions of also, of course, musical, and we will listen to one of the many renditions of this song. But the whole idea is that there is a poem about a woman who walks in the field. And you would ask yourself, so Rachel, why did you say that this is somehow connected to the Shoah? And this is exactly the point. When Leah Goldberg finally responds in her own personal subtle way to the pressure to relate to what is happening, she will do it in a Leah Goldberg way, which does not seem to be Holocaust related for which we will have to pay very careful attention. So I, I left the Hebrew background uh, there and we are looking at one of the translations. There is more than one available, but I have chosen this one. Look again, I'm taking you back to the Ivrit so that you can fully see it, those of you who read Ivrit, and now at the backdrop, and you can see that the Ivrit starts with the question, Ha'omnam. And Ha'omnam, again, I can see the translator struggling because I, I chose this one because I think it is more appropriate. But Ha'omnam could be translated not only as, is it true, but also, can I believe it? 
Is it possible? There are tones you know and finesses to them. Is it true, Omnam? Will there ever come days of forgiveness and mercy? And you will walk in the field and it will be an innocent walk. And your feet on the alfalfa small leaves will, gent will be gently caressing and sweet will be stings when you are stung by the rise broken stalks. And the drizzle will catch you in pounding raindrops folly on your shoulders, your breast and your neck while your mind will be clean. You will walk the wet field and the silence will fill you as does light in the dark cloud rim. And again, you can wonder at me, Rachel, didn't you say that this was Leah Goldberg's response to the pressure to relate to the Holocaust? Where can you see it? So let us continue. And you will breathe in the furrow in breath calm and even, and the pond's golden mirror will show you the sun up above. And once more, all the things will be simple and present and living. And once more, you will love. Yes, you will. Yes, once more, you will love. You will walk all alone, never hurt by the blazing inferno of the fires on the roads fed by horrors too awful to stand. And in your heart of hearts, you will be able to humbly surrender in the way of the weeds, in the way of free men. So as I sometimes do with you, trying to uncover the secrets or the beauty of a poem, I suggest and I recommend to start from the end. While the poem starts with the question, is it true, Ha'omnam? It ends with a promise. You will walk all along, never heard by the blazing inferno of the fires on the roads fed by the horrors too awful to stand. So here it is. There is a commitment to the narrator voice of the poem to that you that Leah Goldberg, the poet, speaks to, and it could be just another face of the same Leah Goldberg that is suggesting that now she cannot walk all alone because there is the hurt of the blazing inferno of the fires on roads fed by horrors too awful to stand. So actually, this is Leah Goldberg's response. We'll go back from, from the beginning. Anything that I would love to do, I cannot do now because of those blazing fires, the terrible inferno of the horrors too awful to stand. And therefore, my poem about it is about a promise of a better world to come. So now let's go back to the beginning and see what is this hopeful promise of life that will happen after the horrors too terrible to put to words. So before I even go there, one needs to address oneself to Leah Goldberg's need to hush, to silence, to quiet, pain, anxiety, horrors. She comes from a personal story of terrible anxiety, terrible horrors. Born in the year 1911, the family will wander in the roads during World War I. And when they finally reach back Lithuania after the Russian Revolution and the response of the people fighting against the communists to Lithuania, she 
her mother and her father. Her father is caught by the Lithuanians fighting against the communist, is accused for being a communist. The story goes because his shoes had a tinge of red in their color just because of that. And he is terribly tortured for a whole week by a group of these fighters who take him to fake executions. Six or seven or eight times, they march him to, do, to, to be executed and then they don't and again and again of which he will be totally traumatized and later sink into a mental illness. When Leah Goldberg and her mother finally make the decision in 1935 to make Aliyah, he cannot come with them. He is a very, very sick person. And therefore, they sent him to the best sanatorium that they can afford back in Königsberg, where she was born. So when the Nazis rise to power, so when the Holocaust starts, they know that he will perish, not even as a Jew, probably as a mentally ill person. And therefore the pain and the guilt of having left him behind is something that will mark all of her life and all of her writing. And therefore, even this reference to the Shoah is going under the lines, horrors too awful to stand, because she comes from a family that experienced horrors too awful to stand even before the Shoah. So therefore her response to horrors is trying to imagine a world that is free of that. And she will ask the question, is it at all possible to live in the world without these? Will there ever come days of forgiveness and mercy? Look at the deep doubt and the even deeper hope. Can humanity get over what is happening now, World War I, World War II, the horrors in between, and reach a time of forgiveness and mercy. And should that alevai happen, here is the promise that she makes herself or that other persona. You will walk in the field and it will be an innocent walk. So even the ability to walk in nature is perceived as a gift and innocence is perceived as a gift for the days of forgiveness and mercy. And now see how the signs or the characteristics of that world of forgiveness, how sensual they are. And your feet on the alfalfa small leaves will be gently caressing and sweet will be stings when you're stung by the rice broken stalks. Do you get it, reader? There may be a time when you can enjoy the sweet caressing of leaves, and then the only sting that you will feel will be that of the broken stalks of rye. What a blessing to just feel simple, innocent, natural, slight pain and nothing beyond. You want to notice, and you can see it in the backdrop of the Hebrew in the third line, a word that was not translated and is very interesting. So I'm reading the Hebrew again, just to the third line. The English translation says your feet. The Hebrew says something totally different. Machsof actually is the decolleté, you know. 
is the opening of your dress or top for a woman normally and whatever it is willing to show. So there is a tinge of sensuality to the word, a tinge of maybe erotic. So her naked feet is like, you know, showing a little bit of other parts of your body, your myself, décolleté, and maybe it's a little bit less innocent and more sensual, that too will be allowed. Once you get that picture of being totally touched by nature, it's sweetness, but also it's normal natural pain, we can go to the next stanza. And the drizzle will catch you in a pounding raindrops folly. Wow, rain, you'll be just able to enjoy rain. And then again, the whole sensual part of it on your shoulders, your breast and your neck while your mind will be clean. So no worries, no guilt feelings. And then this whole body and again, maybe not so innocent, maybe a little bit more sensual. You will walk the wet field and the silence will fill you as does light in the dark cloud rim. So we, we are getting ready for the stanzas that will deal with the dark cloud. And she has this dark light rim. My, by, by the way, a, the Hebrew does not have the English expression of the silver lining of a cloud. So when people speaking Hebrew want to make this similar metaphor, normally we will use the quote from the Leah Goldberg poem, Kaor Beshulei He'anan, just like the light around the dark cloud. So we have moved from the touch all the way to be drenched or maybe, you know, immersed in water to the light, but already the dark clouds are coming. So by way of promising this to the future, is it not clear that she's saying to her readership, and I can do none of that now because my mind is not clean. And I cannot walk an innocent walk. And I cannot let myself feel sensually because my mind is full with worries and guilt and anxiousness. So the dark clouds will come. And again, all these things promise for the future. And you will breathe, breath calm and even. And then you will be able to see those reflections Paul's golden mirror will show you the sun up above because you cannot even contemplate that right now. And once more, so there used to be a pass. There used to be a time when things were simple and present and living. But the now of the poem writer is the exact opposite. This is promises for the future. So things now are not simple. And they are not presence. There is an absence of all those people over there. And there is no living, there is dying. And therefore one cannot love. And once more you will love. Yes, you will. Yes, once more you will love. And as we have already seen the last stanza, you will walk all alone because nowadays she cannot allow herself this pleasure of solitude because she is heart hurt by the blazing inferno, etc. And in your heart of hearts, you will be able to humbly surrender in the way of the weeds, in the way of free men. That will be in the future. At this point in her life, she cannot enjoy all these things. And a I, I gave you another version with a slightly different translation, but here we are uh, with this Leah Goldberg poem. So let me uh, take you back a little bit and uh, let me check if there are any questions before I invite you 
to listen to one of the many renditions of this song. Vivakasha Judith, go ahead. Uh, which year did she write this poem? 1943. 43, so it was already in Israel. After, after the German invasion to the Soviet Union, right. and the, the, the shooting pits and the killing, etc. And also, we know historically that as of November 42, the information about what is happening is known in El Israel because we have the ultimate reaction of all the people, Mikola Amim, which is a response to a famous telegram that arrives uh, to, to the uh, president of uh, the World Jewish Congress telling them what is happening in Europe. So by 43, they know in El Israel. They absolutely know. Yes, Matt, go ahead. Um, this business about walking alone, did she have any belief in, in Hashem or God or whatever? You, was she religious at all? Like a, many of her generations, she comes from a traditional home. A, she wrote poems that are later adopted by both the conservative and the reform movement as part of their machzorim. I will show you one of them. She refers to the divine many times in her poetry. Was she a practicing person? I don't think so. I just, I just remember one of my favorite songs of all time from the show Carousel about you'll never walk alone. You yeah. Know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe for her, the idea of freedom is the ability to walk along. Remember, 43 are not very safe years for the Yishuv in El Israel either. Mm -hmm. So walking along is a symbol of security and feeling uh, safe to do what you want. Okay, I hope this answers your question, Matt. Thank you. Uh, anybody else, Chavirim? Okay, so this is time for the musical rendition, and I hope you will enjoy it. My choice, whenever I can, of course, is Chava Alberstein. Had 
And let me take this time also to welcome people who did manage to join us in spite of the Zoom difficulty. And as I'm moving on to the next Leah Goldberg poem and much earlier one, uh, I'm checking for raised hands with comments and questions. None. So let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, we are now reading again a poem that I could say is less famous, but is important for us for a few reasons. Again, going back to what I have introduced from the beginning, that unlike many of the poets we are looking at, and oftentimes my choice of poets who are dealing with things national, Lea Goldberg is a very, very clear choice of the personal. And maybe a good proof for you that even in Eretz Israel, where poetry and literature is oftentimes so loaded with ideologies, with contemporary events, with a, bite, a battles that need to be fought, with arguments that need to be won, etc., etc., there is space and place for the personal. Yeldut, Pticha. כמו הכוכבים המוצאים את הדרך לכל חלון, כמו יום המציץ אל כל עין נפקחת כאור, אצבעות שנגעו בנימת החלום האחרון, והרעידו שמחה, וימוג הפחד, ויהי מזמור. כה פשוט, כה פשוט ומלא, כמו אחו ירוק, המחבק את השביל האבוד, וטל וטלטן וטלה. Childhood. Introduction. Like stars who find the way to every window. Like a day who peeps at every opening eye. Like light. Fingers that touch the strands of the last dream, and made joy tremble, fear faded. A melody was born, him chant song sounds, possibilities of translating Ms. Moore. So simple, so simple and full, like the meadow hugging the lost trail, and dew and clover and a lamb. And I like to step out of my PowerPoint for a minute. I'll step back to ask you a simple question. What is this poem about? How do you see it? Because she gives the title Childhood. But do you read it as a poem about childhood? Is it a poem about waking up in the morning? Or is it about something else? anybody Vicky it YouTube. seems like it's it's a it's a poem about being acted upon uh, by external things rather than the the child or the individual opening their eyes and seeing it's as though the day sees them the outside sees you all of these external things are they are the ones that are the actors Mm -hmm. All right, but it is, is it about the ones who act? Do they act in the morning as I wake up? Do they act in the morning of my life, namely my childhood or something else? I think they act all the time. It acts all the time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Vicky. Anybody else? What is the poem about? Uh, 
All right. So if I do not get any other guesses or people who venture to offer their reading, let me offer you mine. And I'll go with Vicky. But I'd like you to notice the first word again. Kemo, like, as. So to me, this is a reading I'm going to suggest. She's talking about something that is out of the poem that we do not see, and she is equating it to what is coming now. So what I am trying to reach out to is that other thing. What is Kmo? What is like? So let us try and read the metaphor, the, the comparison, and try and figure out what is the thing that she is equating to this. Like stars who find a way to every window. And I'm going to be a nudge. What is like stars who find a way to every window? Like a day who peeps at every opening eye. What is like a day who peeps at every opening eye? Like light. What is like light? Fingers that touch the strand of the last dream and made joy tremble, fear faded. And to me, here is the answer. A melody, a mizmor. And look at the Hebrew. The English cannot catch it. Vayehi mizmor. And you know where this comes from. It comes from Vayehi Or. To me, what Leah Goldberg is doing in this first Aleph of Yaldut, this is what we call Ars Poetica. When the poet is describing the phenomenon of creating poetry, she's telling us how a mizmor, a poem, is born. It's an act of creation. She doesn't really know how it happens, how a poem is born. So let's go from the beginning because now we know. She told us. And I'm going to take this last line. Mizmor hukmo. All right, the mizmor is like stars who find a way to every window. So when I create a poem, it is born out of a natural phenomena of the stars who light every window and will find every crevice to shine through. And so they reach me. A poem, a mizmor, is like a day who peeps at every opening eye. When you are ready and open your eye, the day will be there and the poem is like that. The poem is like light, kaor. And then you totally see the, the structure of the Ivrit. Look at kaor, and then three lines further down, vayehi, mizmor. Just like in the story of creation, vayehi or, she experiences the creation of the poem. Fingers that touch the strand of the last dream. As I was waking up last dream, there were these magical fingers and they touched the dream and made joy tremble, fear faded. So there is a great joy when a new poem comes. It is strong enough to clear the fear. And we spoke about concerns and, and fear and traumas in the life of Leah Goldberg. Vayihim is more. The English really does not do justice to it. Now that you have that mizmor born in your hands, you can start looking at it and admire it. So simple. So simple and full. And then all the possible metaphors, excuse the mistake, like a meadow hugging the last trail. Just think of this beautiful, beautiful image because there is always a trail in which you can be lost 
but the meadow is hugging it. And now these three metaphors, like meadow hugging the last rail, and then and what have we lost in translation, of course, is the sound, because the Hebrew gives you that other element. We have seen the light of the birth of the poem, but now we need the sound effect that poems have vital, vitale, vitiltan. And the Hebrew can, of course, rejoice with these sounds that sort of repeat each other and with less concern to what they mean, tal, vitale, vitiltan, much more to the sound. So actually what we are witnessing here is one of Leah Goldberg's early poems trying to share the excitement the ecstasy of being able to write a poem. And Matt, yeah, your comment or question, please. Yeah, my, I just, this, this thing at the beginning, this A, introduction, the structure, and then the indentation of the, the last three metaphors, it's like she's doing some kind of documentary thing almost. She, she's documenting a feeling. But she's making it like an actual document, sort of, you know, this is the way word would indent things if you asked it to shift text over. And why would somebody start with an indented, if this was her, why would somebody start with an alpha and an introduction thing? I, I've never seen something like that in a poem anywhere. Uh-huh. What if uh, just the title of this poem is actually introduction. Can you then deal with it? You'll have a series of poems about childhood. And the first one is called introduction. And in it, she invites you into her magic world of creating poetry, like the discovery of herself as a poet. Does that work for you better? Yeah, but I, my structured idiotic mind would like to see a B somewhere with another poem. <laughs> oh, there would be, only we are not studying it. Uh, there are though. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's and I will show you what uh, happens in other poems where people have opted to study only part C and neglected A and B, okay? <laughs> okay, and so thank that you. Your structured mind will be put at ease, I hope. But <laughs> okay. th thank you for that, Matt. And uh, anybody else, please? All right, so th this is always a treasure when one can find, and I'm actually looking for these systematically, when poets are willing to share with us the magic of being a poet, the magic of being able to write and to, to invite us into this moment of wonderment. Wow, the Yehim is more. I don't know how it happened. And suddenly I have a Mizmor, I have a poem. And I didn't even know, didn't pay attention. It just happened like creation. And then Matt will ask, does she believe in God? And I don't know, I just read her poetry. And I think she at least can be absolutely in awe was this magic phenomenon of being able to write poetry, okay? And thank you for that. And now we are going to a very, very famous uh, Leah Goldberg poem because uh, this one is much less so. And you remember that I called my chapter uh, and I tried to structure my classes, Roads. So different poetry of walking of experiencing changes movement. And this is a very famous one. It is called the end of the road poems. And you can see that there is an A and a B and la 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 and C. Okay, so here's the C. Let me start with the C. The C is the part 
that you will encounter if you attended services in reform synagogues, and sometimes I've seen it even in conservative synagogues. So much so that when you encounter this particular poem of Leah Goldberg, they only use the C part, the last one, that it got a name of its own, just like you have different PU team in services, like you say, let's say the Aleinu. So I can hear people say, we are going to say now the Lamdeni. But I don't want to introduce to you the Lamdeni as I see it only in Sidurim, but I'd like for our congregation here to be able to see the whole poem. So this is entitled Mishirei Sof Haderich, End of the Road Poems. And just like the poem Yildut in the introduction that we have seen is a poem that works with this recognized poetic structure called Ars Poetica, when the poets talk about the process of writing. In a similar way, there is a recognized poetic structure in which poems, poets try in a poem, sometimes a long ballad, sometimes a different structure, to view different phases of life. You can think classically of the Shakespeareans, the whole world is a stage and people are mere actors and then the morning and the noon and the growing up and the aging and all that. <clears throat> so Shirei Safadirich, End of the Road Poems is part of that axiom recognized poetic structure of trying to have a glimpse, an understanding, an analysis of human life, of what happens to us with age. And it comes late at life, relative, I mean, she never reached a very old life. Looking back at as people would look at their life. I need to maybe mention that people of my generation growing up in Israel, we know this by heart. This is the type of poem that would be recited in events. This is something that you will quote a, a, to a friend a, for an event and a life, a marking event, a, a life cycle event, etc., etc. הדרך קשה עד מאוד אמר האלם, הדרך ארכה עד מאוד אמר הגבר, ישב הזקן לנוח בצד הדרך. Let's do just the first verse, end of the road poems. The road is very pretty, said the boy. The road is very hard, said the youth. The road is very long, said the man. The old man sat by the road to rest. This is an amazingly good opportunity for me to suggest another characteristic of Leah Goldberg poetry. Unlike some of the poems that we can read by Alterman, for example, even Shlonsky, and for sure, Orzvi Greenberg, and for sure, Wieseltier that I haven't taught yet in Pradesh. The metaphors, the biblical allusions, the, the linking and having conversations with earlier poetry, with other images, etc., that makes sometimes the reading so difficult and complex. There is a simplicity to Leah Goldberg. There is a way of reaching out to the reader, creating very simple metaphors and allusions that, that speak to your heart that do not need an elaborate explanation. And yet when you read it time and again, you will see how deep it is. It's not simplistic. It is just accessible. And now as we have gone through the three phases of boy and youth and man, and stopped at the last line of the first verse, the old man sat by the road to rest. So look at how 
we are not learning from the old man, but by what he says, as we have done with the boy and the youth and the man. Old men teach us by what they do or what they are, or sometimes even by their silence and rest. So the sunset dyes his white hair gold and red. The grass shimmers at his feet with evening dew. The last bird of the day sings above. Can you remember how hard, how long was the road? So you may think that the poem is about the process of going through the different phases of life. But I think that the different phases of life, being able to see the beauty, the hardship, the length, are just a preparation for old age understanding when you have become part of what surrounds you, the sun and the grass and the dew. And there is a song that accompanies you, a bird that sees you and is singing above your head. Do you remember? Because old age indeed is about remembering. Do you remember all the phases of the road? Is it important for you to remember? Chapter one, and we are going with math with the structured way of going to be directly. And now suddenly, instead of describing the third person, the young man, the youth, the man, the aged man, the old man, etc. Suddenly, the narrator poetic voice is turning to the reader and speaking in the second person present. Amarta yom rodef yom velayla layla. Hine yamim bayim belibcha amarta. Vatir e aravim uvkarim pokdim chalonecha. So now there is a voice talking to a person, to us, the reader. Maybe still the bird talking to the old man. Who knows? You said day follows day and night, night. You said in your heart days are coming and you saw evenings and mornings in your windows and you said there is nothing new under the sun. So indeed, uh, you do not need to be a biblical scholar to recognize Psalms 19, let's go to the third line, day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveal knowledge. So whether Leah Goldberg believes in God, whether she is a practicing person or not, we do not know. But the fact that she is fluent and she can weave in, into her poem a quote from Tehillim is very apparent. So this conversation of recognizing the passage of time is indeed relying very heavily on Tehillim, on Psalms. And, and here you are aged and old and gray and your days and numbers increasingly precious. And you know each day is the last under the sun you know every day is new under the sun. So last and new will bring us to Kohelet, to Ecclesiastics, where again, there is a, po the, these are texts, these are beautiful verses that speak of the conversation between man and reality, man and the world, man and life. 
and let us read them again so that we are reminded. The word of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says Kohelet. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Hevel Havalim. What profit hath man of all his labors wherein he laboreth under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation comes, and the earth abides forever. The sun also arrives, the sun goes down and hastens to place where he arises. The wind goes forward, etc., etc. And the last line, And Leah Goldberg is having a conversation with this and rather there is nothing new under the sun and you know each day is the last under the sun and you know every day is new under the sun. So we have moved from a description of a third person, you know, third persons, the boy and the youth and the man and the old man. We now have moved to a dialogue, dialogue type conversation with a you, you know, and you have seen, and it has a tinge talking to Ecclesiastic, talking to Kohelet, and yet presenting her own reading. You may know what Kohelet knows, but you may also claim your understanding that every day is new under the sun, not like Kohelet said in his bitterness maybe. And now only we come to that which many congregation have coined the Lamdeni. And we have moved from A, third person, B, second person that you speak to, to the personal. Now she is talking about herself. Now is her prayer. Lamdeni Elohai Barech Veit Palel, Al Sod Ale Kamel, על נוגה פרי בשל, על החירות הזאת, לראות, לחוש, לנשום, לדעת, לייחל, להיכשל, למד את שפתותיי ברכה ושיר הלל, בהתחדש זמנך עם בוקר ועם ליל, לבל יהא יומי היום כתמול שלשום, לבל יהא יומי עלי הרגל. Teach me, my God, to bless and pray. For the secret of wilting leaves, the brilliance of ripe fruit, this freedom to see, to feel, to breathe, to know, to hope, to fail. Teach my lips a blessing and a song of praise when your time renews with morning and night so that my day won't be as yesterday and the day before it, so that my day would not become a habit. If you look very carefully, the expression kitmol shilshom, days like yesterday and before yesterday, which is biblical, is picked up here by Leah Goldberg in the prayer for the ability to recognize the beauty in every item that is created, which is fruit and leaves, but also freedom. And then all those feelings to see, feel, breathe, know, hope, and fail. She's praying for the ability of praise. She's praying for the ability to be taught how to pray and how to praise with every day. Lest her day will be like yesterday and the day before lest your day should be habit. Need I tell you that, of course, Agnon is using the same as a title of his, one of his greatest novels, Tmol Shilshom. In Jerusalem, you have a cafe called Tmol Shilshom. So these words of poetry and literature live among us, even in, in physical places. Uh, needless to say that there are many, many people around the world that love this poem tremendously. There are also many, many people who 
recite the Lamdeni in different congregations without knowing that it's Lea Goldberg, because you know that it's not the custom in Sidurim and Machzorim to state the name of the writer. It appears just like an ancient piyut, and we do not know who the writer is. So oftentimes when I teach this to people who, who are used to, to being part of reform congregations, they say, but this is the Lamdeni. I say, yes, but it's Lea Goldberg. And, and they wouldn't know. And so it's a big surprise for them that it's Lea Goldberg. And then I teach them the first two parts and the ability to see the whole sequence. So as you can see, Matt, your structured mind is indeed justified this time. And we are not only reading a part, but the whole A, B, and C complex of the poems of the end of the road. And I welcome your comments or questions if there are any. Anybody? Okay. Any particular? Yeah, Jean, your camera is such yes. that I can I know. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I just wondered when she wrote it, what year, and what year she wrote Childhood. A childhood is early. Childhood is from the 30s when she just comes to Israel. And this one is much later. In, it's from the book called Mukdamu Mochar, early and late. I'm gonna say probably late 50s or beginning of the 60s. Thanks, okay. It's, it's one of the latest uh, anthologies of Leah Goldberg poetry that appears in her lifetime. A Mukdamu Mochar. I used to have it, it used to have a sort of a green cover and we, young girls and women at the time, we all had a copy of Mukdamu Mochal, just like we had Rachel poetry and Alterman stars outside, etc. Thank you for the question, Z. Jean, anybody else? At what time did I start? Hmm, 11.15, something like that, I think. Okay, and we will go a little bit longer, not for 40 minutes, but uh, the class is recorded, so you can listen to it later. Those who joined us late, and I'm sorry about that, Jonathan. Uh, any more questions or comments about Shirei Sofa Birich? None. So if that is the case, let us continue and go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Now, this is easy because this poem is one of the very early ones and it is written in Bonn when she is in Germany working on her PhD. Is there a comment or a question or anything? Okay. So we are looking at Yamim Levanim and one of the things that sometimes you can find uh, on the internet, especially in, in the, on the internet site of the National Library of Sifriya Lumit in Jerusalem, where they have archival material for great poets. So we have the handwritten page from a notebook from the 1920s when Lea Goldberg is in a German, or maybe the very early 30s, as she's finishing her PhD and she's writing this poem there. You also may want to know and note, and this is why I added it, uh, the way she is dressed, which is so mm. totally different from the pictures of her that we see in Israeli attire and in dresses or tops that are much more the style of Israel of the 30s, 40s, 50s, than this very fancy dress that goes along with her life in Germany. A, this is one of the poems a, that was set to music and a, therefore we will be listening to it, but we want to, to use it as again, one of those very personal poems, not so much Ars Poetica, not so much discussing the process of writing, but I would say rather the process of being. So let me start by reading the Ivrit for you. Yamim Levanim. ימים לבנים ארוכים כמו בקיץ קרני החמה, שלווה בדידות גדולה על מרחב הנהר, חלונות פתוחים לרווחה אל תכלת דממה, גשרים ישרים וגבוהים 
בין אתמול ומחר. לבבי התרגל אל עצמו ומונה במתינות דפיקותיו, ולמתק הקצב הרך נרגע, מתפייס, מוותר. כתינוק מזמר שיר ארסו, טרם סגור את עיניו, את האם הלאה נרדמה ופסקה מזמר. כל כך קל לשאת שתיקתכם ימים לבנים וריקים. הן עיניי למדו לחייך וחדלו משכבר לזרז על לוח שעון את מרוץ הדקים, ישרים וגבוהים הגשרים בין אתמול למחר. Forget everything I said earlier, because this is one of the poems that does call for a little bit more of explanation uh, in, you know, contradiction to what I've said about some of the simple allusions in Leah Goldberg poetry in some of the poems. So let's get to the white days, these long summer days, okay? And first of all, you know that when you live in Europe, when you live in places like Berlin and Bonn, indeed, summer nights, summer days can be long, you know? So white long days like the sun rays at summer. But in that, there is a great solitude and serenity on the river's surface. So yes, the Rhine flows through Bonn, where she lives when she writes this. But we can also feel a major, major experience in the life of Lea Goldberg and that solitude and sometimes really loneliness. But here the choice of words is such that alongside the long white days like summer, she is not complaining about loneliness, rather there is an acceptance and serenity on the river surface. Windows wide open to a great silent blue sky, straight high bridges link yesterday and tomorrow. We will speak about the bridges in a moment because uh, people oftentimes uh, add to the teaching of this pictures of a, the bridges over the Rhine that she could enjoy and walk across in her daily walk from where she lived and the university. So this metaphor that indeed works very well for us, straight high bridges link yesterday and tomorrow. The bridge is a metaphor for time passing, but it's also a very real image in her life at the time. And now we go deep. Now we go into an experience that it is sometimes hard to put your finger on, and we will go literally word by word. Levavi hitragel el atzmo umone bimtinut defikotav. My heart got accustomed to itself, patiently counting its heart, its beats. Let me say something. Heart beats are pretty difficult to control, okay? I mean, yes, it will get faster if we breathe fast, if we make an effort. But basically, we do not think about our heartbeats. The heart just beats away as we live. And here there is a call to pay attention to that part in your body that indeed you need to teach yourself to pay attention to. My heart got accustomed to itself. There was something maybe different and then I needed to exercise maybe the serenity, teach my heart to patiently counting its beats. Why, was it impatient? Did she need to learn patience? Is she teaching her body like her soul to live in a different way? Faith, relaxed, it surrenders to the sweet, soft pace. Like a baby, 
singing lullabies before falling asleep, which is, I hope I highlighted it, yes. Like a baby singing lullabies before falling asleep while the tired mother falls asleep, stops singing. So here's an image that she sees and creates for us of a baby continuing to sing because its mother had fallen asleep. So there was a song that was started by the mother and because she was tired and starts sleeping, the baby continues singing. The baby learns to rely on itself because the mother is now asleep. And the heart needs to be able to do that, to be relaxed, surrenders to a sweet, soft baby, like the baby. What are we missing in translation? Look at the Hebrew at this highlighted part, the second line, et ha'em halea, while the tired mother, but what is lost in translation, of course, it's not ha'em ha'ayefa. It's ha'em ha'lea in Hebrew, which is tired, but it's also her name. So she manages to introduce in this subtle way herself as being the mother of her heart, putting her heart to bed, teaching it to sleep, singing some sort of a calming down song. There must have been a big excitement before. So just like the earlier poem, Yeldut, when I ask you, what is like the stars? What is like this? Why is this lesson needed? What kind of an excitement existed before? Concern, worries, who knows? She's now speaking actually of an experience of self-control. It's so easy to carry your silence, white, empty days. Is it now? Or is it again part of the process of persuading yourself? My eyes learn to smile and cease to look at the clock face for the race of the hands. She is revealing just a little bit and not much more. Just this little bit. My eyes learned to smile. Were they weeping? Was she sad? Why did she look constantly at the clock face for the race of the hand? Why does she need to, need to train herself to stop that? The bridges straight and high link yesterday and tomorrow. Does she see it out of her window? Is this the sort of soothing metaphor, just like the bridges connect the two parts of the city on both sides of the Rhine? I wonder if I included a picture. No, I did not this time. Sometimes I do and sometimes I do not. I don't want to <coughs> force the particular Bonn images so a poem set to music, it became a song, we'll listen to it in a minute, is seemingly something very peaceful and calm, but Leah Goldberg always requires a closer reading because this peace and quiet is actually the poem that tells the story of the need to calm yourself the need to reach serenity, the need to, express, to accept solitude, to stop wishing the time to go by, to stop looking at the clock. And may I suggest to stop waiting? Was she waiting for somebody? Was she waiting for an event? We do not know, but let us a listen at least to again one of the renditions. This will take me a little bit longer, but I hope I'll be able to find it. Oi. Ah, 
Uh, I do not have it, so I'm so sorry. Uh, I think it's worthwhile, so why don't you give me a moment and I'll pick it up from YouTube very quickly. Uh, okay. All right, and we will go back and do it again. trying to do one more poem, but we'll take your comments or questions. Rina, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Um, when was this written in, re in relation to her making Aliyah and her father being in the asylum? After her father was tortured and he is sick already and first they lived together with the mother, etc., and the father in Kovno. And then they put him in the asylum before she travels to study in Bonn because it, it would have been too hard for the mother to take care of him alone. So this is after, but it's way before she makes Aliyah. She's still in Bonn and then she will travel back to Kovno and work for a little bit in the university there. And only in 1935 will she make Aliyah. So this is not related in any way to the Nazis. I mean, no, couldn't her, be. Her being in Bonn is not being affected by the Nazis. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. It's before. So I mean, the party is there, but Jews can still study in universities. She can study, you know, the particular Hebrew spoken by the Shomronim, with the Semite languages scholar there. Uh, absolutely. This is, you know, the, the, those great days of social democratic Germany in between the two world wars before the Nazis rise to power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. It's an important clarification. Uh, Jean, yeah, please go ahead and tilt the camera <laughs> a little bit so I can see you. Yeah, okay. Um, 
the order of the verses seems to change between your between the original handout and your screen and the song. So I just wondered if there is a right and a wrong or if people just do it as they want. No, no, no. They don't do it as they want. The song mixed it up. The way I taught it is the proper order. And I'm sorry that if okay. the handout is different. The way I taught it, this is the order. And I'm sorry if it wasn't the same. I'll have to go back and check and correct my soul sheets. Thank you for that. Yeah, and I was going to make a comment about Shlomo Yudo changing the order. Uh, and most of the singers do because they like the last verse where the mother falls asleep, the Lea mother falls asleep to conclude with that. And then they repeat the first verse. <coughs> yeah, A, I, I think it's very important that the last verse as we studied it is the one where she teaches herself to not watch the clock all the time. That, that's indeed the concluding line uh, for me. Beseder, any more? All right, the, the one we are going to is not that I don't love them all, I do. Uh, otherwise I wouldn't choose to teach them. But Tel Aviv 1935, first of all, you don't have to ask me when this was written because it's very shortly after her Aliyah. So Tel Aviv looks a little bit better than in this picture. The picture is slightly earlier, <coughs> but it's, it's already a city. And I'll tell you why. 1935 is just that moment in history when Tel Aviv just is in the midst of experiencing a major wave of immigrants coming from Poland, starting in 1934, etc., the fourth Aliyah. Uh, sorry, uh, after the Polish wave of Aliyah, and already we can see the beginning of the Aliyah that is encouraged and later forced by the stronger and stronger Nazi appearance, and by 35, the Nazis are already in power. So Tel Aviv is developing in an unbelievable speed. And it really becomes a city in a very short number of years. And Leah Goldberg is not coming, you know, to a pioneering kibbutz and, and building something from the sand in the desert. She is coming really to a real city. And yet she has a very sensitive eye and ear, I would say, to this multitude of immigrants from different places and what they bring to the air of Tel Aviv. Could she also be speaking about herself, being an Ola Chadasha? Tranim al gagot abatim hayuaz ketranei sfinato shel Columbus vekol orev shamad al chudam בישר יבשה אחרת, והלכו ברחוב ציקלוני הנוסים, ושפה של ארץ זרה הייתה ננעצת ביום החמסין כלהב סכין קרה. איך יכול האוויר של העיר הקטנה לשאת כל כך הרבה זיכרונות ילדות? אהבות שנשרו, חדרים שרוקנו אי בזה, כתמונות משחירות בתוך מצלמה, התהפכו לילות חורף זקים, לילות קיץ גשומים שמעבר לים, ובקרים אפלים של בירות, וכל צעד תופף אחרי גבך, שירי לכת של צבא נחר, ונדמה אך דחזיר ראשך ובים, שטה כנסיית עירך. Let's do the English and then We'll talk about this. Anybody would like to read this in English? Not one volunteer? Please? Yeah, I don't mind. Okay, go ahead, please. Tel Aviv, 1935. Memories of memories, then the aerials on the city's roofs were like the masts of Columbus's ships, and every raven that perched on their tips announced a new continent. 
and the kit bags of travellers walk the streets, and the language of a foreign land cut through the heat of the day like the blade of a cold knife. How could the air of the small city bear so many childhood memories, wilted loves, rooms which were emptied somewhere, like pictures blackening in a camera, the clear cold nights reversed, rainy summer nights across the sea, and shadowy mornings of great cities, and the sound of footsteps behind your back drum the marching songs of foreign troops, and it seems, if you but turn your head, there is your hometown church floating on the sea. Tada. If you but turn your head, there is your hometown church floating in the sea. And what are walking in the street are the cyclonei hanusim, the kit bags of travelers. This to me is one of those most beautiful images of capturing the experience of Olim coming from so many places and create, carrying with them the memories of winters that are different and summers that are rainy and other languages and marching soldiers and fears and dreams. And yet in spite of all those things that maybe were not so great and that you were lucky to escape, but there is the longing. And maybe if you turn your eyes to the sea, you can see your hometown church floating there. And it's Dafka a church and not a synagogue because probably the church is more characteristic of the towns that people have left and they miss it yet and they long for it. So here is the new immigrant just arrived. 35 is the year. Leah Goldberg landed in Tel Aviv and she captures this feeling of all these, you know, probably moving around and sitting in cafes and talking in the streets, all those foreign languages. And she can imagine how can the city carry all these dreams and probably pain and disappointment and longing. So here is, if you wish, a poem about Aliyah that focuses more about the dreams and the longings of the Olim than on the goal of creating a Zionist new Israel state, more speaking about the people who are part of that than the goals they are here to achieve. I think that's a good moment for us to stop.